All right, everybody, welcome back. Another episode of the C-Suite Unfiltered, another edition of The Boardroom. So I am excited to bring on Sam Gustin, who is the owner of Troops Mowing. He spoke at Mike's conference, uh, Lionscape Summit in Louisville, and he reached out and said, hey, I'd love to be on the pod. And I said, I'd love to have you. So Sam, if you want to give the folks maybe just a brief introduction, if they don't know who you are, and we'll roll from there. Yeah, thank you, Leon. I just want to thank you for having me on here. Um, it, it means a lot. So I am living here in a suburb of Austin, Texas. Um, it's Hutto, Texas, and we, we own a lawn care company. Uh, we're working on our second location right now. So we're cool. two weeks into the start of our second location and dealing with all those hurdles and trying to figure out how to copy and paste a successful location all the way back, taking me back a few years to back when I was a solo operator, trying to figure all that out again. Yeah. Uh, and that's kind of where we're at with, with our business. Um, we're, we're in the thick of the spring rush here right now. We're having some employee issues uh, yeah. with you know <laughs> offering people and having them not show up on first day and people smoking weed in our trucks and all the fun stuff. Yeah. So <laughs> um, we have enough work for 10 people and we got about five people to do it. And so we're, we're in the process of jacking up prices, trying to lose customers. And um, we jacked up prices tremendously and haven't really lost a single customer. So that's also another good problem, yeah. uh, but a problem nonetheless. And so that's yeah. kind of what we're dealing with uh, on our side of things. And uh, super excited to you know speak with you, Lee, and uh, continue further in this friendship. It means a lot. Yeah, definitely. No, I, I really appreciate you taking the time to carve out, especially with so much on your plate. So, yeah, um, yeah maybe maybe we dive right into that because, you know, people love the juicy details. So went from sure. you have worked for 10 guys and you have only have five guys on the team or crew members. Uh, yes. w- what happened? Did, was it firings? Was it people leaving? Was it something you made a mistake on? Like, tell us kind of what what happened there. Yeah, I mean, in, in the true nature of taking ownership in all things, I feel I feel like I need to do some self-diagnosis here and see what I possibly have done wrong. I'm sure there's something I could have done differently. Um, We had, we had a good group of guys last year. And one of those good guys is now the general manager of that second location. So inherently we lost him for this location. Mm -hmm. Um, We had another uh, two guys. They were both brothers. One of them, no call, no showed for two days in a row. And we don't have flexibility for that. And right. the other guy had to relocate um, his moving with his wife's family. So we lost like the core of our good employees, November, December, January, which is fine. That's a good time to lose them. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then we had to, you know, trans transfer over and get a bunch of new hires and training, basically starting over from scratch, training a bunch of new people when you're low on cash flow throughout the winter season and jumping right into, you know, 70 lawns a day. Mm-hmm. It's it burns people out. And mm-hmm. throughout that process, we, we've also, uh, I think we hired six people. I think we got six approved job offers and three of them, no call, no showed. And one of them that did show up, we, we caught smoking, you know, weed in our truck and he mm-hmm. didn't believe in P for P and he was, you know, coming from a large scale commercial landscaping company where they're you know, paid by the hour, no like quality yeah. checks. And so he was telling the rest of our guys here, like, Hey, I know how to cut corners. Just like follow my lead, we'll make base pay, you know, it will make more on base pay for X amount of hours than we would on P for P. And like I just broke it down. We had a guy yesterday yeah. made 326 bucks in nine hours. And awesome. I'm like, dude, P for P works, man. Yeah. But the weed in the truck was was that final straw where we had to cut them. And then another guy, um, just this week, he just like verbally assaulted, you know, an employee here. And we just not gonna have, I'm not gonna like deal with that um and then another guy his wife you know had self-harm issues going on where he feels like Mm -hmm. he should just be at home Mm -hmm. and so just dealing just dealing with all that that stuff so yeah yeah definitely it sounds like too like uh not excluding the last employee that you mentioned sounds like it's a personal things going on and hey sometimes you just have to part ways i mean we had that recently at one of mike's locations with um outside of myself one of his most longest tenured employees and just hey stuff happens outside of work we get it and sometimes you got to step away and that's fine those other three folks sounds like there was a very clear grounds for firing and as mike always Mm -hmm. likes to say firing dictates culture so how has that been responded to by the team that has stayed around have the stories come out about all the other negative things that they were doing are they happy with your decision are they frustrated what has been the response been like no they're they're happy uh we we, overall we got the you know the sour apples out we have a really strong culture here Mm -hmm. it's all it's almost like family like we're, we're we tell each other like 
mowing lawns in 110 degrees in the summer is not the most fun thing to do with your summer, <laughs> but it almost feels like you're coming to work with your buddies and getting a paycheck. And so that's, yeah. that means the world to us. And, you know, I'll call our cultural values. We, you know, hire and fire based off of those are hanging up on our wall. Um, <laughs> but they, they took, they took the firings. Well, they, they agreed that they were bad apples and they're bad for the culture. And we told them after we fired those employees, we're like, let's take, let's review our cultural values. And mm -hmm. you tell us if we fired off of those cultural values and they all were like hundred percent. Yes. And yeah. so it, it was, it was a good way to re, re, uh, reinforce our, our culture and, and what we stand for. And it also kind of set the ground rules where it's like, Hey, if, if you're not going to like prioritize positivity and efficiency, we're not going to prioritize keeping you on payroll. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of where, where we look at it from that standpoint. What are the core values that you hold to or, or, or standards within the business that you're going to hire fire over? Yeah. So we, we love acronyms. I don't know if that stems from the army, uh, okay, but yeah. we, use, <laughs> we use troops as our acronym. So okay. T would be thoroughness. R is reliability. O is observant. O is ownership. P is positivity. And then the S is selflessness. Cool. Yeah, I like that. What would you say, uh, you know, obviously you don't want to pick a favorite, but what do you say maybe you naturally embody and really try to embrace as, as the leader of the team? I, I've embraced the ownership standpoint. Uh, we, had, we had a leadership meeting with our office manager and general manager and ops guy, Dylan, that I think you met. And the, the, our GM was the one that was doing bear crawls around the cafeteria. Up at, okay, uh, nice. <laughs> so, um, if, if you don't understand of, that reference – Come to the next landscape. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I sat down with them and I was like, hey, guys, like, this is what you do great. This is what you do great. This is what I see in you. This is what I see in you. And then I opened the floor to be like, I need you to tell me what I'm not doing good at. And so mm -hmm. I, I'm opening the floor for criticism um, pointed at me because I mm -hmm. want to be better for them. And uh, taking that leadership standpoint to where it's like, hey, I'm not perfect and I want to be better for you specifically. I think will translate down um, to, you know, their subordinates as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. And, and, and kudos to you for embracing that because I think personally, one of my favorite things, speaking as the employee, right? You're the, you're an owner, I'm an employee. Um, I'm not oblivious to those rule differences, but that is one of my favorite things about working for someone like Mike is that he embraces constant feedback and constant improvement. And mm -hmm. that, that is why I want to work hard for someone like that because he doesn't stick his nose up at you when you have an idea for improvement or when you want to push back. As long as it is constructive in nature, you can throw anything in Mike's face. And I respect the heck out of him for that because I know he will listen to me and other people on the team if we are being constructive with our feedback. I mean, a, a week or so ago, myself, Mike and Liz um, had probably one of our most heated conversations we've had in a long time and at the end it was like all mutual respect all positivity and action was taken and like Mike could have pulled the CEO card or like you guys don't understand or it's my business and he just like sat and was receptive and he pushed back on me and Liz and it was awesome um, so I think the more you can embrace that the better uh, bond you will build with your leaders and your team and I think the frontline employees will also see that so kudos to you for embracing that man yeah let me ask you this question Lane you don't have yep. to touch on it if you don't want to Cool. I was listening to that last C-suite. Uh, do you mind opening up on what that conversation was about? You guys kind of left it vague. Um, yeah. <laughs> and I'm sure it probably was intentional, so you don't have to. I was just very curious kind of what you pushed back on him for and I guess maybe what you expected out of that conversation and, and how he handled it. Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Um, I won't get into the specifics, obviously, because it is related to the, to the franchise. So I want to uh, not only protect kind of the, the intellectual property of the franchise and the decisions we are making for, for Mike's business, but um, ultimately, it was actually a pretty organic conversation. I think the positive is that Mike fosters an environment where he's willing to take feedback and criticism. So the conversation came on organically. It is something that I did bring. It, it was I was the one who started the pushback. And it came out organically because I, I don't know if the timing felt right or we were on the topic and we just started talking about it. Um, but what the, the feedback I did offer and what I can share is I have a different perspective than Mike. I have a different perspective than Liz. And I think that's something you need to make sure your employees are aware of and embrace that the guys who are in the front line have a different perspective than you. Yes, you have done the front line work. You were a solo operator, but you need to respect that they are currently the front line 
employees, they are currently in the field and they have a different view than you. And I think sometimes that gets lost in the wash as businesses scale up is that, yes, I've done it before. Mike could be like, well, Lee, I've done coaching calls before. I've done franchise sales before. Like your opinion doesn't matter. I, I know I know what you're saying. Versus he was yeah. like, okay, you've been doing this for two years now. Maybe I should be quiet and listen because clearly you have certain frustrations or things that you think could be done better. Um, and I know, I wish I get into the specifics. It's probably one of those things in like a year we'll share. Um, and it wasn't anything negative, but it was ultimately, I have a different perspective and I know what your decision is as the CEO. And I know what Liz's understanding of the position is as the COO, but let's talk to the sales guy slash coach. Cause I do very different things than them on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's what started that conversation. A great answer. And I have another question for you as well. I know yeah. that you probably have some geared up for me, but I yeah. love the playful um, back and forth. So last or no, this week at some point, I believe Monday, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the company Bear Performance Nutrition at all. I've heard of it, but I'm not like overly familiar. Okay. So they're, they're like, like a $60 million a year company. And the dude started it out of his barracks room in the army. Cool. Uh, and they, they are right by um, about 10 minutes away from here. I go to church with like the VP of marketing and I asked cool. to have a meeting with him more. So I was geared, I was really interested how they scaled from, you know, zero to 60 million a year and how like um, day one employees can buy into a vision and culture and mission. Although they might not ever even talk to the CEO. Like how does that vision get translated down to day one employees and that the standard and you know quality is, is met? Um, mm -hmm. I say all that to ask you this question, Lee, with you starting at, uh, off with Mike at just that location, mm -hmm. he's probably sometimes out in the field with you, I'd imagine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, how, how, how have you navigated that relationship to where now he's this like big wig in the industry? Is it weird being like, but we, we, you know, we pulled weeds to get in the flower bed you yeah. Know, so how, how have you navigated that relationship and and uh, give any pointers, I guess, for somebody who might be trying to scale their company up mm -hmm. where they might they might be um, nervous is not the right word, but I, I would hate to lose that. Uh, I would hate to have people think like I'm better than them because I'm, I'm scaling a business, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's understandable. And it's a great question. I, I would like to clarify and take a shot at Mike because he's not here. He only came out in the field when he bid a job wrong. Let's just be 100% <laughs> clear about that. <laughs> no, he, he started it all himself and he works harder than anybody I've seen. But yes, I could tell you many stories of, you know, you got the, the trucks parked just right. So the lights are shining on the house so that you can keep working. Yeah, we mm -hmm. Mike and I've had those moments. Um, I think to, to answer the question directly is, and this is what I've said to folks before, uh, and one thing that you know I have personally kind of taken pride in, and it's not something that employees have to do, but we do regular offsite meetings with our team, and that, and I'm talking day one when I started Augusta, our first offsite meeting was five guys, Mike in Liz's apartment, and Liz and uh, one of her friends like made us dinner, and that was my first ever offsite meeting, and it was like ribs and chicken and like all the fixings, right? And in that offsite meeting, Mike basically said, hey, here's here's what we did this year. OK, did we achieve our goals? Yes or no? He said, here's what we're going to do next year. And I took notes. So I have all the notes from every offsite meeting I've ever been at with Mike. Uh, so that's seven years. I have like 15, 15 meetings. And what I did to essentially verify if this guy was legit or not was every offsite, I would go back and look at the notes. What did he promise and did he deliver? And it took me about two years to realize, OK, this guy isn't blowing smoke. We're going to build something real here. And he also cares about me. And going back to my previous response, fostered an environment where I can provide feedback for improvement. Those two things together made me want to stick with him no matter what. Um, and, and that's like the logistical side. On the personal side, he's one of the most caring people I've ever met. He truly cares about his employees. He truly cares about his customers. And he truly cares about business owners in this industry and abroad. And like you, you put all that together, like how can you not want to work hard for someone like that? Uh, it, yeah. It's kind of a no brainer for me. And that was, you know, a conversation I had with my wife at the time. Um, she was just my girlfriend. When I first started at Augusta, she was just my girlfriend. And that was a deciding factor for us was, okay, like where are we going to live? And I was like, I think this Augusta thing's real. I think this Mike guy's legit and he's the best boss I've ever had. And I want to be a part of that. And if you're okay, like this is, I want to live in Washington so we can keep doing this. And um, I know I'm on an aside at this point, but I think he just sold me so hard on the vision. And to answer the question specifically, he wrote down his goals. He publicly stated his goals. 
and he hit every single one. So I think for business owners, for someone like yourself that is a visionary, that is long-term growth minded, make the goals attainable in the short term, knowing that you can sell people on the long term. And that's what initially got me to buy into Mike is every short term goal he put was hit. And if we didn't hit them, which was very rare, he was very clear as to why we didn't hit them and where it was his fault as the owner, not the team. And that was important as well. If you can do that consistently, it's just like building a pattern, then you know like, okay, the long-term stuff is gonna happen eventually. Yeah, that was a great, great answer. So, Appreciate that. Was that. Long, that was long-winded. I don't even know That's if I really good. answered it, but. <laughs> no, it's good, perfect. <laughs> yeah. Sponsored by Celsius. Dude, yeah, I, I got mine too, actually. I think we've got the exact same flavor, so. <laughs> Look at that. That's crazy. Yeah, Meant there it is. Yes, sir. Um, no, good, good question. Yeah. Feel free to interrupt me whenever, uh, I know on, on the pod, some people are like, dude, you should talk more. I'm like, I'm not dumb. People want to hear Mike. <laughs> um, I don't know, man. So. You got, you got some hot takes. You're very, um, you're very educated is I guess a word that I would Thank use you. for somebody. Cause you and I are similar in age where I hear you talk and I'm like, I need to be smarter because <laughs> Lee is, yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. I, I hear yeah. myself talk and I hate it. So, uh, <laughs> same. Dude, same. Yeah. Same. Yeah. cool. All right. So uh, I did have a specific question I want to get into, especially because you mentioned, Hey, like we, we had some, some bad fits, some bad apples. I needed to get rid of them. Um, that's great. I think you made the right choice. Sounds like the team responded positively. What do you feel like having the military background? And, and I, I'm not, you know, I don't have a military background. I, I do come from a long line of military men. One of my brother-in-laws is a, is a former Marine. Um, so I respect that culture heavily and um, understand a little bit about how it works. It's very black and white. It's very chain of command. If you don't like something, you are you shut up. Like, it doesn't yeah. matter, right? If your CEO said something, you don't give your opinion. It doesn't matter. Um, mm -hmm. So how do some of those leadership skills or practices translate to now the civilian world where, you know, people can yell back at you. People can be upset with you. People can say, I don't like that. Um, was that hard for you when you first started getting employees? What do what do your soft skills look like now with employees? Um, so yeah, just kind of expand on that. Yeah, Lee, that's, that's a fantastic question. Um, when I, when I was in the, in the military, I, I got out as a staff sergeant. Uh, so I was, I was in a position to be a platoon sergeant for okay. the third infantry division in, uh, in Georgia. And I'm not infant. I'm, I'm not infantry. So I come from air defense branch okay. and how they lead is drastically different than how the yeah. infantry. Lead. <laughs> and so when I went to this infantry unit, I stood out in, in a positive way. And it's because, mm -hmm. um, air defense, you know, we, we lead, I would say we lead with compassion, mm -hmm. um, is at least that's what my leaders have taught me. And, and what I've, what I've, what I've taken away is you look at the leaders that you didn't like to follow. And then you look at the leaders that you would die for. And it's like, what can I tweak to make sure that I'm like the perfect leader for other people. Mm -hmm. And I was just very intentional about, you know, being that for, for my people. Uh, one thing that I did is I remember a specific story where um, I was very intentional about leading from the front and like, like, I'm not going to tell you to do something that I wouldn't do myself. And for example, and now that I'm out of the army, I can probably tell the story. My, my first sergeant <laughs> would, would be pretty upset with me if he found out I did this. Yeah. Um, but we had, a, we had a, a soldier who didn't show up to a formation because he was drunk. And this was at, you know, mm -hmm. eight in the morning. I don't remember. Yeah. But um, I told him like, hey, we're all accounted for. I had no clue the soldier was, but I'm like, I'm going to go find him and figure out what's up. Hey, we're all accounted for nothing to worry about here. Don't look over here. Everyone's here, I promise. And then I went over to the uh, soldier's barracks and the dude is hammered. Yeah. And I'm in my like army uniform, not even like my PT, it's just army uniform, got my boots mm -hmm. on, told him to get dressed. And I just took him out on like a six mile run and I just ran him until he threw up all over himself. Oof. And it was just like, hey, I'm not even going to throw on my PTs. I'm going to run in boots alongside of you. Mm -hmm. and I'm going to talk with you and I'm going to let you know it's like, I could put this on paper and like demote you and take your pay, but we're just going to get out after it. You're going to learn a lesson that you'll never forget. Yeah. And yeah. <laughs> that kind of came from when I was lower enlisted, I had a, um, I forget what the soldier did, but I had a battle buddy who did something wrong. And then mm -hmm. our sergeant made him put on a gas mask and do burpees until he was like throwing up in a gas mask. Yeah. And I was like, yeah. So I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> there's a there's a fine line, but but typically how I translate that here is I don't tell my employees to do anything I'm not willing to do myself. 
Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to be out there with them. I, I personally feel bad if I'm behind the computer, like that's my weakness and I just got to get over it. Mm-hmm. Um, but th- they, they've seen me be out there working later than them. I try to be here first thing. I, well, I'm always here first thing, but I try to be here last thing as well. It's tough having a kid now and, and dealing with babysitters mm-hmm. and all that. But, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So just, you know, leading by example and I, I'm not like the do pushups because I said so <laughs> type of leader. I'm like, I don't, I've never even raised my voice at any employee or soldier mm-hmm. for that matter. Um, I just feel like there's more effective ways to lead. Mm-hmm. That's good. Yeah, no, I respect that heavily. I think it, it's a tough dynamic when you maybe come from more of a black and white world like the military too. You know, there there are gray elements, like people have personal things going on in their lives. Their, their babysitter canceled, like whatever it is. So you yeah. do have to be flexible, but then where are the, where are the uh, break, don't bend rules in the company? I think that revolves around, you know, what are the core values? What's our start time? What are we going to hold to as a team? Um, it's hard to navigate that, I, I think. Do you feel that the way in which you've navigated navigated has really been hard for you to shift to or do you feel like you've naturally been more inclined to um be compassionate yeah nat- naturally come com- uh whatever that c word you just said i can't compassionate think of it. Com- <laughs> yeah yeah compassionate I'm, I'm naturally inclined to be compassionate um i just think that comes from like having a faith background and mm-hmm. i'm just trying to show jesus to people It'd be weird if i'm like hey come to church with me this sunday and then i'm dropping f-bombs being like yeah i hate you you're an idiot <laughs> It yeah. just wouldn't add up. So yeah. it's, I think I'm more inclined to be compassionate. That's cool. That's awesome. Yeah. And you, you mentioned that, that um, you know, you, you do go to church. You obviously have faith and, and you want people to love Jesus. And I, I respect that. I think that's awesome. Um, do you, is that kind of like a personal ethos, a business ethos? Um, you know, what do you feel like is kind of your goal in life with the business and, and for yourself? Yeah, that's a great question, man. And, and I, if I told the long story, the long version, we'd be here for a while. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I'll condense it. And I think I might have shared it with you before, but um, I strongly believe that it was God's will for me to start this company. I mm-hmm. did not want to do lawn care. I was wanted to do sales. And through a long story, making it short, he pushed me to go towards lawn care. And so I kind of just think like he's the CEO and I'm just the operator and like I'll pray and ask him like what you know, I'm not going to move without them type of deal. Mm-hmm. And um, that makes business pretty easy when you yeah. go about it that way. <laughs> I just sit here and follow, follow what I'm told to do. Um, and so it's, yeah, personal business ethos that kind of blends into each other. I, I want this company to be a blessing to other, you know, employees and customers. And we've had employees like the guy that had to relocate. He, he mm-hmm. came to my office and cried and didn't want to leave. And, you know, I prayed with him and, and, um, yeah, just, it's an opportunity to show Jesus to people and I'm just using lawn care as that, you know, as that meant there's that method to do it or that medium to do it. Um, but yeah, I just I just try to be good to people and and hopefully people are good back to me. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> that's really cool. Yeah, that's something that, um, you know, in the last pod I, I talked about with Mike, um, where I'm like, I'm trying to work on kind of my personal ethos or like what I believe or my tagline, which sounds so dumb, or like my brand. But I, I do think there is is positivity to having core values or core statements or things that you really focus on. And even just sitting here at my desk, I got, I got two sticky notes over here of um, two quotes that other people have said that, you know, I look at every morning, one of them is stay humble, stay hungry. And that's just like, Hey, like you, you gotta like put your head down. Don't, don't worry about yourself. Don't, don't like look to glorify yourself or make yourself look good. Like stay humble and, but also stay yeah. hungry because you can do both of those at the same time. You know, a lot of times people talk about, you know, even in sports, right? Like he's an athlete, he's so hungry to win and this, but then he's like the flashiest guy on the team, you know, like pointing at the name of his Jersey, things of that nature. It's like, you can be yeah. both, you can be hungry and humble. Uh, and then the other one is like, there is no replay. And that's just like, Hey, you, you get one shot. And it's like, what, what comes out of your mouth doesn't come back in, right? And the way you present yourself or your company, like that's it sometimes. You get one shot, there's no replay. Um, yeah. and, and my recent one is, you know, that I'm really focusing on is like, work hard, be good to people. And like you said, it's, you know, hey, how can we just be good to people? And I think there's so much hate in the world and there's so many, so much negativity. It's like, just be good to people. And it sounds so simple. It's like, do we have to reteach people the golden rule? <laughs> it's, it's, I was, I was walking, I was walking my son in the stroller, listening to that C-suite podcast. And when you initially said that, I was like, that's so simple. But then if you actually like break it down, like the best things in life are simple. Right. Yeah. But I was like, <laughs> yeah, just like work hard, be good to people. Like what, like what else is there really to, to do? 
right? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's beautiful. It's, it's very, it, it seems oversimplified, but it's also very deep at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. And that's one thing that I hold myself to is, is just, I never want to be the person that says something negative about someone else, either, um, you know, to their face and in a non-constructive way or behind their back. Uh, you, mm -hmm. you have to say negative things to people sometimes, right? But you yeah. can do it in a constructive way. Hey, I didn't appreciate the way you said this. Hey, the way you handled that customer interaction was inappropriate and unprofessional. Like there yeah. are negative situations in life, but you do not have to handle them in a negative way. And I think that's where that stems from. It's just avoiding the negative altogether. Yeah, a hundred percent. And, and dealing with people, like you said, you have to say negative things sometimes. Um, I, I had a, I had a, it's not a hard conversation, but I've had a hard conversation with our GM and he's amazing at like nine out of 10 things. Like he's mm -hmm. spot on. And the only thing he lacks is being analytical and like good with math. Mm -hmm. And I just told him, I'm like, Hey, you are like one of the most positive people, almost like too positive. Like we should probably get that checked out. Yeah. <laughs> but like you're one of the most positive people I've ever met. And like, you're enjoyable yeah. to be around. People want to be around you. You're a natural leader. He's dude's 22 years old. And I'm like, the one thing that you need to like work on to be an absolute weapon, whether it's for us or just in life is math. And if you can get math down, you are unstoppable. Mm -hmm. totally. And so I could have went and been like, dude, you suck at math. Right. And then like that conversation <laughs> would have went a different way. Right. Yeah. So there, there's certainly ways to like navigate those hard conversations. Like you're saying. Yeah. That's awesome. Cool. Yeah. I want to, I want to change gears a little bit. Um, kind of talk about the industry specifically. So how many years have you been doing this again? Uh, full-time three years. Okay. Full-time three years scaled up pretty quickly. Obviously you got mm -hmm. location number two. So cl clearly successful in those metrics, right? Um, yeah. what do you feel is like one of the biggest threats right now to the industry? Obviously, you know, Mike and I recently talked about, uh, you know, privately, you know, there's a lot of fear mongering. I mean, just look up, you know, any, and, and I'm not pointing fingers or naming names here. Go, go to some of the big YouTubers in our industry. Uh, you'll see some very fear mongery thumbnails, right? The leads aren't coming in. Spring is slow. Economy downturn. Uh, not naming any names. Uh, do you think like that's the biggest threat? Do you think there's something else that's happening in the industry? Like what has your spring been like? Do you feel like your numbers are way off, way above, way below? Just kind of general thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I, dude, I thought I knew numbers until the spring when I was like raising <laughs> prices and I'm just like, I don't get it. Like I'll, I'll send you, I'll send you a text. I'll send you a text of what we started the year off with our hourly rate. And mm -hmm. then where we're at now and we haven't lost customers. And I'm curious to see if this is crazy to you or not. Uh, but while I send this, I'll do my best to multitask. Yeah, you're it's, good. Um, I, I don't know if I'm just optimistic in this, in this sense, but I don't see like any short term threats really mm -hmm. uh, other than, other than getting reliable labor. But I feel like that's, that's more of like a intrinsic issue that we can solve. Mm -hmm. But in terms of like external threats, um, I don't really see anything in the short term. It may be like, I mean, it's a, it's a, an election year. Right. So maybe just people being like super fearful mm. about whatever. Um, but I, there was a, there was a saying where it's like the, the president only impacts like the super poor and the super rich. And like, I'm neither. Yeah. And so it's just like, <laughs> I don't know. Here, I'm going to send this to you. Um, but I think maybe long-term would be something along the lines <laughs> of uh, robotics or, or trying to like, be the first player if as long as you know economies of scale and price matches up that could be a longer term threat mm -hmm. but where 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 do you where do you uh, your conversations you've had where do you believe is like more of a short-term threat um uh, yeah i think anytime there's an election year you always see a little bit of instability typically if you look at like historic data and, and i'm no um you know historian by any means but if you do look at the data economy usually bounces back after a u.s presidential change whether it's red or blue uh, you know and someone's going to make the comment that liam talked about politics again I'm, I'm not trying to um but it historically has positive impact in q1 q2 of the following year who knows if that's gonna be the case this year i mean shoot we had covid we had a market crash that wasn't a crash and we had a recession that wasn't a recession and now we have massive inflation like who and we're just relabeling things so who knows yeah. <laughs> um I think honestly, like short term threat, I think is labor, but I think that we can be proactive with it. And one thing that 
you know, Mike has, you know, two corporate locations that I, you know, check in on overseas. They have great general managers. I'm as hands off as possible. Like, hey, let the general managers run. It's their success or their failure. I'm just here to support. Um, but both those general managers started hiring in early February, if not late January, to start mm -hmm. mowing in the first couple of weeks of March. So we were a whole month and a half ahead of when we were going to start mowing. I think that's just where people need to be is, and this is just general business advice, like be proactive. I think a lot of times we're very reactive and this industry can feel reactive, but we literally operate in seasons. Like at some point as an owner, as a manager, you just have to stop being reactive and start looking at the data. And that's one thing that I'm excited about that, you know, coming to this winter, Mike's kind of project that he's working on right now is like, how do we solve the winter work issue in this industry? Um, so there's a teaser, come to conference, and uh, he's gonna have a plan for that. Like, what are we going to do to solve the winter work issue? And he's got like four or five different plans and he's gonna tweak them and roll them out. Um, so I think it's like getting, being proactive to like the labor that you need before, and then also being proactive, like what is winter gonna look like and how do I not go in the red massively? But I think that's not even necessarily like an external threat. It's just, we just have to be better as owners and managers, right? Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. Yeah, there, we, <clears throat> we've implemented winter services uh, last year, two years ago, maybe. And it, yeah, it's a game changer. Just like yeah. dropping your frequencies, but raising prices. And I think like our revenue dropped by like 30%. Um, but we still were, you know, making very small amounts of profit throughout the winter. Mm -hmm. So at least you're staying afloat and you're able to pay yourself. You're not losing money. It's, yeah, it's huge. Yeah, cool. That's awesome, man. Well, any other thoughts, comments, questions? I went through my list. I don't know if there's anything you wanted me to talk about or ask you or you want to ask me. Nothing is off limits on this podcast. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, I was thinking you you had that, that hard work hard, be good to people. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, what's like a – I was thinking of a slogan that I could use for my business. And I mm -hmm. think you'll find entertainment in this. Um, I, it's more BH, less BS is kind of what yeah. we want to be at. <laughs> and so we might just, we might throw that up in the office down there for the guys cool. to see. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'm curious how you approach coaching calls for mm, your, yeah. um, franchisees. And I know you're not going to talk about like the scorecard and like the, you know, the stuff that's, you know, secret sauce to Augusta. Yeah. But, um, I guess. If somebody were to come up to you and be like, Lee, I'm here. I have a $500,000 a year company. I want to be, you know, X amount profitable. What are going to be the biggest KPIs that you're looking at in terms of making sure a business or a franchise, for example, is successful? Yeah, no, it's a great question. And yeah, like the KPIs we put on the scorecard aren't necessarily secret sauce. Now, there are certain equations, certain data points that we are looking at internally at Augusta that like, hey, join Augusta if you want to know what we're doing. But um, in terms of the KPIs, like realistically, and this is stuff that, you know, Mike has said in public videos, but what I need to know and, and you know, um, I have we now have a coaching program inside of Augusta. So I had to actually figure out how to coach coaches. And that was a whole different beast. So it was answering questions like this to myself. So I was like, well, okay, I can listen to my recordings of coaching calls and know exactly why I said it. But why did I say it? Like, what, what was the, what were the measurements and the calculations I was doing before words came out? Um, so, so mainly what we need to know realistically is like, what's the revenue at currently, right? What's our close ratio currently? How many existing customers do we have? Um, th those are going to be like main. We also need to know what um, like the bank account looks like, you know, and that's something that, you know, you have to be willing to share. What does the bank mm -hmm. account look like? Um, and then just the contextual things, right? What season is it? Uh, you know, how many guys do you have? How many trucks do you have? Are you currently at capacity? Like, are you booked out? And this is where I'm just going to start rambling. But there's so many things that come into a coaching call. Are you booked out? Are you not booked out? Okay, well, if you're booked out, you know, four weeks and your guys are overworked and you're, you're on overtime and your close ratio is 60%, raise prices like crazy, slash your close ratio down to 25, 30% for a couple of weeks, catch up on the backlog, be ultra profitable, don't burn your guys out and then recover, right? And there's so many different variables that go into it, but those are like the main things I need to know is, yeah, like I said, revenue, close ratio, um, what did I say? Uh, recurring customers, I think. Yeah, exist, I said. existing customers, yeah. Existing Bank customers, yep. Yeah. And then it's all the contextual things of the business. So bank account, uh, team members, trucks, uh, like how far are you booked out? Like are your guys overworked? Are they underworked? What type of, what time of year is it? Those are going to be the most important things. And then from there, you know, if, 
it, assuming they're in Augusta, I know their hourly rate. I know what they're charging. If they're not in Augusta, then yeah, I need to know their hourly rate. What's their average mo price? What's their average customer lifetime value? Like our annual value? Like how much are they supposed to be making on their customers? Things of that nature. Um, so it's a long winded answer <laughs> and yeah, I didn't give yeah. ultra specifics, but you really have to get really good at looking at like all this information and then bringing it down to one or two points. And that's where Mike is really working on, you know, with the turnaround series, his next book is going to basically be a book on how he does turnarounds. So that's something that, you know, he and I through coaching calls have figured out, okay, like what data do I need? What are my inputs to give me an output of action? Yeah, that that's great. And are, are you, um, I know you're probably not super hyper focused on P for P and like calculating that and the ins and outs of that, but I'm curious, like I just sent you our, our prices and kind of what we're going through. Yep. As you can see, we're almost raising it to find like that equilibrium of like, mm -hmm. where can we start losing a good percentage of customers? Cause we're already, you know, increasing our prices like crazy. When you're increasing prices by different increments, trying to find that equilibrium, you're going to have some customers that are priced at X and then some customers that are priced at Y yep. and some customers that are priced at Z just because you're trying to gradually increase and find that. How would you run P for P? What would be your, like, would you just average out those hourly rates and pay that out or what would you do there? So you're saying that you have a customer A and B that this a customer A is being charged at, you know, hundred an hour customer B is being charged at 70 an hour, just going to use some round numbers. And you're mm -hmm. saying, uh, so if there, if you have bid that prop, both of these properties, let's say you bid both of them to take a half hour, so you're charging customer A 50 and you're charging customer B 35. Am I getting that correct? Yep. Okay. So what you would have to do is you either pay your guys out on, on an average or on each individual rate. On average, I don't think it's fair because what if your Monday route, you have more customer Bs. Well, now the guys yeah. are like, well, shoot, I can't make P4P. And then your Wednesday route, you have more customer As. They're going to be like, I love P4P. So I don't like the average idea or I should be making more, right? So there's, there's yeah. a couple ways that plays out. I think no matter what, you always should try to keep your hourly rate standard or mm -hmm. you have to adjust the budgeted hours to accommodate whatever rate is most common. And I would say that's also not the most fair. The most fair is what's the hourly rate? They get a percentage of that hourly rate, right? Whatever the price is. Or you just pick one, potentially to hire, but now a $35 mo on a $70 an hour customer, right? Gives the crew a half hour to mow. Well, now a $35 mo on a $100 an hour customer, you just gave the guys 20 minutes, Yeah. right? So you just took away 10 whole minutes for them. They're not gonna be happy with that unless you have ridiculously good route density. Right, yeah, and I, I'm gonna have a follow-up question here. And I feel like this is gonna be gold for people who might not understand P4P great. And mm -hmm. I'm not saying I understand it perfectly yeah. yet either, but <laughs> you're good. Um, one, the way I look at it is like your budgeted hours. I don't like touching budgeted hours because to me that should be a constant, right? It's mm -hmm. like whether yes. my price is fifty dollars an hour or seven thousand dollars an hour, this four thousand square foot is only going to take me fifteen minutes, right? Yeah, yeah. And so I try to I view that budget hours as constant, and then I'm always tweaking the hourly rate, and then the price of the customers is that um, dependent. And so I. Typically, we've always had a constant hourly rate where we've never ran into this issue, but I thought we were going to lose customers at that second price I just sent you, and we have. Mm -hmm. So I'm just mm -hmm. like, because we need to lose customers with right. lack of employees. And so I'm like, shoot. So now do I go up to that third number I just sent you and hopefully lose some? And mm -hmm. But then that our minimum price is like crazy. Like I can't even justify anybody saying yes to these prices. Yeah. And But, <laughs> but they are. And so yeah. I, I don't know. So I guess next year we'll, we'll have that standard hourly rate. Just curious how to navigate that now with trying to find that equilibrium. And then I don't want to go too aggressive and just lose everybody. And I'm like, no, no, I'm sorry. We'll go back to the other price. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I would say you have to think about what the goal of P4P is, and that's to get employees to think like owners and to be compensated like owners. So in order for them to be compensated like an order, owner, they need to understand how they're getting paid. You understand looking at your PL, how much am I taking out at the end of the month, at the end of the year, whatever, right? Mm -hmm. They need to also understand it. So splitting the difference, right? And, and there's a great book on this, never split the difference, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, like they are not going to understand like, okay, so now the numbers are just Fugazi and you just came up with something and I'm just gonna trust that you're paying me. And like your team probably trusts you enough to where they will just roll with it, but then they don't actually 
understand P for P, not saying they don't already, but in the context of this conversation, then they don't understand it because you're just fudging the numbers, splitting the difference, and it doesn't make sense. So it really comes down to like, how many of those customers are charged on an hourly rate that's different to other customers? Can you go in and manually make all those changes? And in P4P, the software, you can because you can put in various hourly rates. So what you could right. do is say, okay, they had four jobs at 75 an hour or 70 an hour, just use my round numbers. They had four jobs at 70 an hour, and then they did 3.5 budgeted hours at 70 an hour, and then they had 10 jobs at 100 an hour, and they did 6.4 budgeted hours at 100, right? And then you can do two different um, pay rates in the P4P software. However, that just takes more work for you, right? right. <laughs> that, but yeah. that, in my honest opinion, that is the most fair. It's going to take a lot more work for you to do. Sure. Yeah, I, I get that. Yeah, I appreciate you diving into that. That was one question I was just like racking my brain around. I'm just like, yeah. what? <laughs> like, what do I do? Uh, last question I have for you because I know you're busy, manly. Um, no, it's all good. What would be what would be some of like What's your biggest personal weakness and what's your biggest professional weakness that you that you'd like to Ooh, get better at? Good question. Uh, personal weakness, pretty easy. Uh, physical health, in all honesty. I, I push it aside way too much. Uh, I don't work out nearly as much as I used to. Uh, I don't walk the dog as much as I used to. Uh, I enjoy walking my dog, um, but I just I have pushed that aside for uh, professional goals, if you will. And and I love working the long days. I love working with Mike and Liz and the team. Um, and my wife supports me, so that's great. Like if she supports long hours and I'm getting paid, like why wouldn't I want to work long hours, right? Yeah. Um, so that's my biggest personal weakness. I'm definitely trying to get better at it. Uh, by next conference, I do have a goal. So we're going to work towards that. Uh, just be in better shape. And, and for me personally, it's, it's not a looks thing. Like I, I don't care really what I look like. I've always been pretty confident in myself. Uh, I just want to be healthier, right? Like I just want to live a healthier life, be around longer, uh, you know, things of that nature. So I just need to take that more seriously. Uh, per professionally is a very good question. Um, I would say... In all honesty, I have worked really hard to not suck at the things I've historically sucked at professionally. <laughs> um, but that's not saying I'm, I'm perfect by any means. There's a lot I could work on. I, I think it's honestly, um, and this is going to sound dumb, but whatever. I think it is allowing others to help me. I really think that's a, that's a problem I struggle with. And I think that, um, and, and this is just kind of a... Um, a catalyst, I guess, for working with someone like Mike. Well, he's working the long hours and he can do it. So like, why can't I do it? It's like, but I'm not Mike, right? And it's like, I have made that realization. I did try to do his schedule. I did try to do his hours and it's like, just not possible. And I, and I, and I accepted it, but now it's, okay, well, we have this cool project or there's this cool thing with the owners inside of Augusta or there's this cool thing with Copilot. And like, I want to be a part of it. And it's like, regulating myself and asking for help or, or saying no to things even saying no like i can't put time and energy into that cool project and there's already a team on it so like why do i need to be there so i think that's probably one of my biggest professional weaknesses is it's partly asking for help and partly saying no to things because when you work for someone like mike there's always cool stuff happening and i always yeah. want to be a part of it and i just shouldn't be <laughs> yeah i can see that that's yeah. that's true I think, yeah, I think mine's like delegation. It's probably rooted, mm -hmm. rooted pretty much where you're at. It's just, uh, yep. I don't, it's a weakness. There's no excuse for it. I just feel like yeah. if I want it done a certain way, I should do it myself, but I know that's, that's bad. And I have to like catch myself from getting a little frustrated if something's not done the way I think it should be done. But then taking ownership, I probably didn't outline exactly what the finished product looked like in the first place. So mm -hmm. that's on me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. I agree cool. with you. But yeah, that's that's awesome. That's awesome. I do appreciate your time, brother. It's, a, yeah. it's been awesome. If you want, I know I'm putting you on the spot. Any there not financial advice? <laughs> oh, gosh, I wasn't expecting this. I, I, so, I can give you a second to think because I, I can I got one. So <laughs> yeah, let's let's hear yours. All right. So mine is it's very simple. Uh, it's just very straightforward. There's someone out there that needs to hear this probably all of us just go check the tire pressure just in all your work okay. trucks trailers especially trailers like you're going to be loading up lots of product at spring rush check the tire pressure just be a little bit extra safe <laughs> as good um only thing that's coming to my mind right now which is stupid is uh don't sweat the petty things and don't pet the sweaty things that's, yes sir i, don't know, <laughs> I like it <laughs> uh, but that's that's all i got hey awesome. would, would you be interested would you be interested in doing some sort of like physical fitness bet 
by the oh, time okay. uh, for uh, for the conference. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let me know what are you thinking. <laughs> I think I'm intrigued. Like, I am a betting betting man. I love just small, stupid bets. So <laughs> yeah, I feel like I want to have like. Um, I'm pretty sure you probably have like uniform requirements for the conference, but for like one session, if if I win or whatever, you'd have to wear a troops jersey up on stage, <laughs> and then you know if you win, whatever you say, probably off the bus or something. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. We can we can brainstorm that. All right, because I got to lose yeah. weight too, man. I'm with you. Yeah. All right. Fair enough. Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, let's, we'll talk offline <laughs> if you will, but Sam, I really appreciate you coming on. I appreciate your vulnerability, transparency. Uh, I hope everyone got some value out of this. I definitely did. Um, and, uh, yeah, troops mowing, very excited for you. I hope you guys have a great year and uh, like, and subscribe. Thanks, man. Thank you. Lee. Take care, brother.